Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's keynote presentation, Clinical Lab 2.0, How Laboratories Can Thrive in a Value-Based Care System. It is presented by Michael Crossy, MD, PhD, the Chief Executive Officer and Chief Medical Officer for Tricor Reference Laboratories. My name is Judy O'Rourke and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the ask a question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. And now without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Crossy. I will now turn the presentation over to him. All right, um, thank you. And uh, I, I, I really appreciate the offer to to be a speaker today. Um, I hope to uh, present some ideas and some challenges for the clinical labs in the United States, um, specifically on um, really changing our place in the medical uh, delivery system. Um, and the vernacular I'm gonna use is clinical lab 2.0 as the target of where we wanna be. So, so for today, I'd, I'd like to talk about how laboratories can not just survive, but actually thrive in a value-based care system. Um, uh, let me, uh, for the objectives, um, the establishing value, and I purposely put that in quotes because value is in the eye of the beholder, or in our case, the, the, the payer. Um, and the payer is different in different situations. So when we talk about value, I really want you to keep in mind, who is it you're talking about? It's not just uh, uh, one size fits all. Um, secondly, and very importantly, is discuss how the laboratory data, not just the results, but actually the aggregate data that we produce uh, can affect clinical outcomes, both for patients and populations. And that's really a crux issue if you're talking about value. And you're gonna to have to exploit that in one way or another to really bring the laboratory up to uh, parity with our other clinical colleagues. And finally, I wanna push and really, um, this, is, this is probably the most important thing, is lab leadership's role and dealing, uh, discussing with you know non-traditional clinical stakeholders. Who who else uh, do we impact with our, again, not just our results, but our aggregate data? So with those three, I hope to frame a discussion and and maybe jar a few um, ideas or um, uh, dispel a couple of myths that we've uh, entrenched ourselves in over the last. 50 years of clinical lab medicine. So let me let me start. <clears throat> um, Tricor Reference Laboratories, we service virtually all of New Mexico. Um, we have multiple clinical specialties. Um, we have there 12, 1,900 tests offered on the menu. We resulted 14 million tests uh, last year. Um, we, we cover about 60% of the clinical lab work here in New Mexico, and 98% of it is done in our laboratories. Um, with 1,300 employees, our couriers move specimens all around the state. Um, we have draw sites all over New Mexico, 50 plus pathologists working in various AP and CP uh, uh, roles. Um, both from the university, from Presbyterian and Loveless, uh, the three different pathology groups we interact with regularly. <clears throat> and we have very high patient satisfaction with a big focus for uh, Tricorp. 
um, 15 different hospitals in the system around the state. Um, so that's that's sort of the literally and figuratively the lay of the land that uh, that I'm speaking from. Um, we are uh, one of the first uh, CAP 15189 accredited laboratory system. So um, that means a procedure in Tucumcari is the same procedure in Socorro or here in Albuquerque at the clinical laboratory bench. So that's kind of important because that, that uh, leveled and normalized a lot of the data that we use when we're doing aggregate data. Um, I know all of you have heard in probably every talk you've ever gone to, or at least every seminar uh, panel discussion, uh, that the laboratory medicine, you know, affects, has a role in, drives 70% of clinical decisions. And I, I want to dispel that, and I want laboratorians to quit using that. It's not true. It's never been actually completely validated. Uh, the source is uh, somewhat hearsay, honestly. Um, but I want to challenge you that if you're going to say that and you're going to believe it, the, um, you, you also have to concede it through very good validated studies that waste consumes about 30% of U.S. healthcare dollars. So if you just do the math, if you're going to say 70% of clinical decisions come from the laboratory, then the laboratory has to own 21% of healthcare waste. So you can't have it both ways. If you're gonna say you're that important, then one of the things you have to do is use that influence to drive out waste. So I throw this out as a challenge. Um, no matter who the stakeholders are, waste has zero value. And if the laboratory is that important, one of the things we really need to be focusing on is reducing waste, not just within our laboratory walls, but outside our laboratory walls. And I, and I hope to show some examples of how we can influence that. Um, and the second um, challenge is um, we talk a lot about innovation. And in, in fact, when we say we're going from lab 1.0 to lab 2.0, and it's very innovative, um, you have to be willing to accept that innovation requires disruption. Now, in a fee-for-service world, waste is often rewarded. In a value-based purchasing world, efficiency is what's rewarded. So they're, they're really uh, two ends of a very, very long spectrum. And it's okay to survive in one fee-for-service world, if everybody's in value-based purchasing, you know, it's a level playing field. The real danger is getting from that point A to point B. And I would say point B is coming whether you like it or not. So you have to gear yourself toward value-based purchasing, which means driving efficiency, not just in the lab, but in our whole clinical medical enterprise. And labs have to be willing to cannibalize themselves or parts of their business in order to move from a fee-for-service world to a value-based purchasing world. Now, the risk for laboratories, the biggest risk is to wait, is to be passive, is to be the guys in the basement that are just going to wait for the C-suite to tell them what to do next or how much of their budget's going to get cut in the next year. Um, that that is an incredibly risky posture, and I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. Um, along with that, <clears throat> we can't do it alone. The laboratory can only do so much. So what I would challenge my laboratory colleagues to do is to work very diligently on partnerships. Uh, the laboratory has an amazing influence with our clinical colleagues, with our pharmacy colleagues, uh, nursing colleagues, um, we affect all of their workflows and work streams. So the challenge isn't to say we're going to come up with a dashboard out of the laboratory and suddenly drive all the waste out of medicine. That's just not going to happen. We, we can do it, but we have to do it with partners. So I would challenge you to, within your own institutions, within your own health systems, you know, you really need to start looking for those key partnerships and uh, 
uh, literally people that, that you can work with to drive waste out of your system. So partnership and do not remain passive would be the two biggest challenges I would put out there to make it in a value-based uh, world. Um, one of the things, if, uh, just to set the frame of what uh, we're all talking about, and I'm sure everybody has heard at one meeting or another in the last year about Lab 1.0. So when the, that, that vernacular is the past. Lab 1.0 is a value-based system. It's transactional. It's very simple centric. It's a fee for service world. <clears throat> we're really talking about cost per unit. And you know, we're, not, we're not talking about care coordination. We're not really getting out of the laboratory at all. It's very lab centered. <clears throat> in a complicated health environment, that means the lab is just operating in its silos. We do a lot of Lean Six Sigma. We tighten up our game in the lab. We, you know, um, make sure we we don't have any waste, but the waste we're talking about was very lab centric. And so on the graph at the top of this slide, <clears throat> we that's where we spent most of our time. We were real we were hyper focused on the analytical sensitivity and specificity of our tests. We were very enamored with the new uh, tests of one sort or another, whether it's molecular or proteonomics or metabolomics, we're, we're really looking at what we do in the laboratory, as opposed to the black line, which is the pre-analytical, ordering the right test, helping our clinicians order the right tests. Um, and then the post-analytical on the right side there, which is, uh, did they interpret that test correctly? Was it easy to interpret? Um, did, we, did we even... Um, produce a result that was actionable. So those are the two differences. You know, the 1.0 is really based in the laboratory. 2.0 is going to force us out of the laboratory to prove our value. And that's with a patient-centered approach, not a sample-centric approach. Um, we'll be under a bundled payment structure, which means Hospitals, healthcare systems, ACOs, large integrated systems are going to get a bundled payment. And the laboratory is gonna to have to prove that they're worth some part of that pie and, and, and get our reimbursement from our own uh, health system as opposed directly from a payer or an or a outside uh, client. And there too, we have to elevate the, from a transactional of one order, one test can we aggregate things at a cost per covered life? Now we're talking about a population based. And again, if we have all that data, how can we aggravate it for a health plan or a clinic or an ACO to help them take better care of not just a patient, but a population of patients? So um, fourth on that lab 2.0 is diagnostic optimization to are we ordering tests that are appropriate? Are we helping clinicians order the right tests so that care is coordinated? And I'll talk a lot more about that in a, in a few slides upcoming. Um, and again, on the post-analytical side of things, is the test and the result actionable? Is the interpretation easy to read? Is it, are we giving them actually information instead of just data and hoping they interpret it the way it should be interpreted? But aggregation of data is gonna be very key in a value-based system where you're talking about populations in addition to just the patient. Aggregating data for a patient on a longitudinal record, aggregating data on a small population of a clinic, aggregating large sets of data for a entire health plan. And I would argue um, all of us have heard about the triple aim, you know, the, the focus uh, coming out of the Institute of Medicine is that America really has three major issues in healthcare, access to care, cost and quality. And I would tell my laboratory colleagues that that is where we need to focus. That, that triple aim is not gonna go away. And it actually gives us a, a focus of saying, if I think this is valuable, how does it play into this triple aim? 
as a measuring stick for value-based payments. That's not just about our clinical colleagues, that's about us in the laboratory. What are we doing on access, um, patient access, as well as access to data across the system? Hospital, outreach, point of care. I mean, we're the focal point of a lot of that data, and are we making that data easy to access wherever it came in to our system uh, for any given patient? And then cost control. Again, this is not cost per test. We do a lot with Lean and Six Sigma to drive down our unit cost as a cost per test. But the more important thing is, what's the cost for covered lives? What's the cost for episode of care? What's the cost for a population of uh, patients that are underneath a certain plan or a plan derivative? Those are the kind of costs that that bring it to a higher level, and that's much more valuable than a cost per test. And third, and, and absolutely always been the focus of the laboratory, is quality. Quality, I, I think all of us in a, a accredited laboratory have very high standards with our proficiency testing, um, the standardization, the FDA review of the tests that we perform, even our LDT tests that are um, very stringently uh, validated and controlled. Um, quality is the laboratory's claim to fame. We, we, we are probably the leaders in that, in our own silo of medicine. But outside the silo of medicine, um, quality, uh, I think we could have a great impact on. What, what are we doing to help uh, the quality of a patient's care um, and again, that would be a quick example would be how are we helping physicians order the right tests as opposed to guessing what, what the right test is. Um, and again, at the other end of the spectrum is the population. What are we doing for the quality of a population that's being taken care of by a specific group or a clinic? Um, so I, I don't think there would be any reason to think that the triple aim is going to go away. So I would offer that you should use it to really examine where do you add value as a laboratorian in your system uh, to help the greater enterprise uh, achieve the triple aim. So let's talk about access a little bit. Um, data, laboratory data can be uh, generated in multiple, multiple different ways. Here's a, a map of, of New Mexico as an example. Um, we have hospitals, draw sites, and providers, uh, you know, scattered all over the state. Um, if you think about a patient in rural New Mexico who has an abnormal laboratory result, how do they connect into the myriad of uh, hospitals we have, clinics we have, independent providers we have, um, those are really gonna be difficult to um, connect. But the laboratory is the focus of that. We are the hub of this crazy hub and spoke system. Um, so we know that this patient who, who has an abnormal result and is continuing with an abnormal result, possibly getting worse, <clears throat> needs to see a specific provider that might not even be in their zip code, but is across the state um, in, in, with the health plan that's the, the, the center of the payment system. How can we get that patient to the care they need using not just the health system, like the bricks and mortar hospitals and clinics, but the health system that includes the uh, health plan that that patient is being taken care of and the care coordination that might come out of that health plan or it might come out of the clinic they derive from. So uh, that was a complicated um, way of saying it. I have a, I have a, a very uh, simplified real world example of, of where we actually did that. But, but if you're gonna say that the clinical labs guide significant value for the patient, um, it's going to be more than giving accurate results. You're gonna to have to affect not just the result to the provider, you're gonna to have to affect 
care coordination of that patient if you really want to have value. Um, and there's a, an, an interesting um, analog to that is we're also, also in the laboratory very enamored of the tests we do. You know, they're, they're the most accurate, they're the most state of the art, they're the coolest new shiny object that we're offering. But it, if it doesn't really affect that patient's care in a significant way, we're going to have to really think about how we offer and what we offer on our menus. Um, so that, that's going to be a challenge because um, when you stay in your laboratory silo, you want to focus on the test. When you get out of the laboratory and into the enterprise, you want to focus on how did that test actually affect a patient's uh, care. Um, this was something I pulled out of the dark report, and I, it's a very, very troubling thing to me, and I wanted to call it out. And it's where uh, laboratories, large health systems are saying, you know, that whole outpatient stuff and outreach is really problematic and hard to do well and uh, hard to sustain. And, you know, the, the reimbursement is dropping under PAMA, you know, so... Lab outreach is, is really not our core business. We want to hunker down and, and focus on our inpatient business. And I think this is a wrong approach because if, if, if you follow my line of thought, controlling the data, producing the data, accessing the data, and aggregating the data is the value of the laboratory. As soon as you stop collecting data because it's too hard on the outpatient side or there's you know, too many different hospitals and it's easier to leave them in silos instead of aggregating that data on a patient's longitudinal record, um, you're really decreasing the value in a very significant way. You've now blinded yourself to a significant amount of data that a patient follows or a patient uh, is uh, apprised with um, uh, on a regular basis. And so you're, you're becoming blind to that, and that means you can't contribute to it. Um, I'll have an example of that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> so, again, the, the power of the laboratory. Let's, let's talk about cost. So there's access, and again, I hope access, I'm, I'm talking, I, I'm, convinced you that access is as much about access to data as patients' access to a clinic. Um, when it comes to cost, if you look at the Medicare breakdown, um, basically, you know, 50% of the patients are stage one. They're patients with minimal disease, um, not, not really accessing the system on a regular basis, not costing the system a lot. Um, stage two, which is about 40%, are patients that have clinically significant chronic disease, but they're still kind of in the mid-range. Um, the, the high utilizers, stage three, is really only 10% of patients, but they have advanced disease, end, end stage disease, um, on an 18 to 24 months of, uh, of life. Now you look at the, the spend on that, and it's completely reversed. Um, that large population that doesn't access the system is only costing 5%. Uh, the middle group is costing 31%. But that, that little 10% at the tip is costing 64% of the cost. So the, the whole point of the triple aim is how do we intervene early to keep that last 10% from costing such an astronomical 64% of the total spend uh, for the Medicare population spend. And that's difficult. That, that's not an easy challenge. Um, I think for us, though, is if we can start thinking in our enterprises, in our large integrated health systems with health plans, is probably in well care, how can we keep that population healthy? And the labs can play a big part in that. Labs can be a huge tool for engaging patients in their own health care, I believe. 
And in the management, once they have diseases, that middle group, how can we keep them from progressing, say, from progressing from stage one and two chronic renal disease to stage three or, or four and requiring dialysis? How can we provide data to keep that progression down? Um, so that's, that's an area where I think laboratorians have to think differently about their contribution to the value of the lab results that we produce. We, we can do a lot more in the health and wellness side and in the management. Um, one of the things you should think about, I, I, I think the laboratory should think about is, instead of producing a laboratory result, we have been able to show, and I'll show an example of this in a few minutes, of not only what did we result for any given patient, but what we didn't result. So I think when you're thinking about that middle group, that stage two, 40% of Medicare patients, um, we can tell physicians not only what we did on a diabetic, say we did an A1C, but we should also be able to tell them that we haven't done an A1C in six to nine months on that patient. That patient's gone dark. So now I'm talking about value to a health plan of revealing not just what you did, but it's actually more valuable in some cases to tell them what you didn't do. And that, that's kind of a interesting uh, other side of the coin uh, for laboratories to start thinking about how can they produce a spreadsheet that shows not only what they did for a given set of patients, but what did they didn't do? Who didn't show up for that lab draw? Who didn't get it? collected or who it didn't get ordered. Um, so that, that's an interesting way to think about that middle group. When you're managing disease patients, the results are almost as important as the lack of results. So, so again, let's, let's look at this graph. This is, this is lab 1.0 is transactional. Here's a lab result in the middle of the screen. Uh, it's, it's very accurate. I, you know, I'm, I'm very confident that, uh, you know, I could put error bars around that and, and, and assure a physician that it's, you know, plus or minus 2%. And that's lab point one, very transactional, very uh, test focused. So let's call that a serum creatinine. It's 1.1. Okay. Like I said, it's a very good, accurate creatinine. I spent a lot of time validating the test. It's harmonized across my whole enterprise, so the creatinine in one place is the same as the creatinine in the other. That's not an easy thing to do. I mean, lab 1.0 is not easy to, to have a high-quality, rock-solid laboratory with accurate results that physicians never question is not easy, but it's also lab 1.0. You don't get paid any more for the uh, absolutely accurate creatinine. Um, compared to one that might not be. <laughs> but that's what we've all strived for, and that's what we've all strived for in the last 20 years. That's the basis of what we're building on. You, you actually have to have an incredibly accurate lab to go from lab 1.0 to lab 2.0. But now let's take that, what I know about this patient because of my longitudinal record, you know, I can look at outpatient, those two Let's say those two black dots in the lower left-hand corner are previous serum creatinines uh, taken on an outpatient draw. Now the serum creatinine in the middle is, you know, what I'm looking at on an inpatient draw. And then over the next few days, I see two more creatinines that are rising. So that's now become incredibly valuable information. Now, now you're talking about lab 1.5, say because I'm looking at not just the creatinine I produced, but I'm comparing that patient's creatinine with that patient's previous creatinine and that patient's uh, next subsequent draws. Now, it's pretty clear you're seeing a, a trend here that could be you know, significant for that patient. And I put the, the er those aren't error bars I put up there. I, I put that as an example of normal range. So just from, for the, clinical pathologists in the room, you can see that those outpatient draws, you know, there was already a significant increase before that first red uh, serum creatinine from an inpatient draw. 
So the patient was already headed into some renal insufficiency state. And they hadn't actually left the uh, error bars or the uh, normal range, sorry. So now to take that and make it a lab 2.0, I, I would argue that you take that serum creatinine now, with the metadata you have from all your laboratory orders, from outpatient and inpatient even, um, you're looking at a population where you can take that serum creatinine and you add that they're high risk because of their age. They also have comorbid ICD-10 results or ICD-10 codes coming over the same the, the, uh, state they have diabetes and hypertension. So now you've moved that patient from just a lab result of what was a serum creatinine to a high risk patient because of not only their result, but because of data that you combined that puts them in a high risk uh, for a potential bad outcome in this hospitalization. Um, so really th that's the difference where we, we can use much more data than we're normally used to. So I'll, I'll try to tie everything into one example that we've done here in New Mexico that, that, that shows, I believe, the power of the laboratory, dealing with different partners, dealing uh, with not only the data we produce, but identifying data that we didn't have that should have been done, and then reporting that result in a post-analytical phase to folks that could really action on it. And the example is prenatal care here in New Mexico. Um, New Mexico is, is a, a fairly rural state, um, but 72% of New Mexico's birth fall under our Medicaid-funded programs. And 20%, um, when we looked at the data, we, we would say 20% of New Mexico's births receive prenatal care in the second trimester. That's, that's way too many that are receiving care in the second trimester instead of the first. And then 8.5 received no prenatal care. They basically came in at time of delivery without any history. So you can imagine the, the uh, uh, risk of uh, those births. Um, so 30% about received uh, intermediate care, I'd say, but, but still inadequate. Now, if you look at the graph on the right, the cost of newborns with complications is upwards to $13,000, 13 to 14, and fiscal year 10 versus fiscal year 10. This, this is not um, laboratory data. This, this actually came out from, from the New Mexico uh, Senate Finance Committee. So this was already being discussed up at the Senate Finance Committee about how to control Medicaid costs. And you can see why, $13,000, $14,000 per delivery versus an uncomplicated newborn delivery of $800, that, that's, a, that's a big impact to the state. So that kind of frames the, the scale of the problem. And then you look at the background and the, the lab's role in prenatal care. Well, identifying and monitoring a potential monitor mothers. We have first trimester care issues, second trimester care issues, and third trimester care issues. Um, the blood banking stuff that should go on, the infectious disease testing that should go on across all three trimesters. There's a first trimester serum screen, second trimester screen, group B strep within the third trimester, gestational diabetes testing that should go on in the second trimester. And then identifying and monitoring prenatal risks. So again, using ancillary data that we have because it comes over with the lab test of age, possible previous diagnoses, of diabetes or other things, urinary tract infections can be a high risk for some uh, folks. And, and we're doing the, the, that testing. Should we combine it with that prenatal longitudinal record? Yeah, absolutely. We need to pull that in and make sure people are aware that that patient had a urinary tract infection. It might not be something that was diagnosed uh, with their OBGYN. It might have been something that they went to an urgent care for, but since we're the central laboratory, we can connect those dots. And then abnormal prenatal screening uh, needs to be dealt with. So 
identifying uh, uh, births, you know, uh, when we see uh, newborn screening come in, we can we can also use that data where we can alert a health plan or a Medicaid provider of a of a of a, of a birth that should have the newborn screening and tie that back to the prenatal care, actually. So uh, the way we did this in this example, this, this isn't a hypothetical. This is actually something we did. I want to be clear about that. Um, we received an eligibility file from a large health plan. We matched that eligibility file with Tricor's patient repository, focusing specifically on Medicaid beneficiaries. And then we used our, our internal IT and analytics system to look at health conditions and looked, produced targeted interventions. That means the member file um, we got from the payer, we key members were identified and matched, uh, successful matches were pulled out and analyzed with our targeted intervention module, which is looking at the standard of care from the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. So we could say for these women, this is what we've done, this is how far along they've done. This is their care gaps. And then the results were pushed back to the, that managed care organization for care or, uh, coordination. And we did this on a weekly basis for seven months. So let me give an example here of uh, again, this this wasn't this this isn't made up. This was an actual patient, 23 year old female in rural New Mexico. Uh, she had accessed Albuquerque e ED, which is where the pregnancy test was performed. Um, later, she received a prenatal workup with a nurse midwife. Um, and several months later, she also accessed an ED and had a urinary tract uh, diagnosed. Uh, Later, uh, toward nine months, you had a baby girl that had some complications and was admitted to the uh, neonatal intensive care unit, uh, was there for a number of days, weeks, and the discharge uh, cost to that system or to that health plan was about uh, $789,000. Similar thing, another 23-year-old female in urban New Mexico, in urban New Mexico, so the first was female, the second was uh, urban, I'm sorry, the first was uh, rural, and the second is an urban uh, example. Uh, again, an ER diagnosis of pregnancy. Um, this one actually had a care manager coordinated uh, OBGYN uh, care so the woman did get into care from an OBGYN office. Um, they received all the prenatal screens. A baby boy was born a little post dates at 40 weeks and the baby and mom were discharged uh, into care. And that was about a $2,200 pregnancy. So massive, massive difference in cost of care simply because that first example was uncoordinated. So let me give you a second example, um, a 30-year-old female, so she's um, access a family practice with a diagnosis of pregnancy, receives, uh, this one received monthly drug monitoring that we were performing here in the lab too. Um, baby girl was admitted to the NICU, um, discharged from the NICU, and again, 990 six thousand dollars it's an incredibly expensive uh pregnancy uh kind of age matched example two a 27 year old female initial prenatal screen uh we called uh, identified a care manager at the health plan to coordinate care uh patient was brought in to be followed by a high-risk OBGYN. uh group. Um, the baby was born at 39 weeks. Uh, the mom and the baby were discharged. That was, you know, $3,000 uh, pregnancy. Again, you're talking orders of magnitude of, of uh, impact uh, to the health system. Um, the, the, the cost um, 
of that of those pregnancies are, are taken out of the Medicaid fund, which means those funds aren't there for other things. So, uh, you know, this cost differential is pro is probably the highest value a laboratory uh, can deliver, way beyond the testing for cell-free DNA or prenatal testing or even group B testing. So aggregating information and pushing it to care coordinators for them to action on it was a much, much higher value than the actual laboratory tests themselves. But it required getting out of the laboratory. It required partnering with a health plan and care coordination and the OBGYN departments that are two um, uh, sponsor institutions. So again, lab 1.0 is about lab and treating physicians, very transactional, doctor's order tests, lab produced results. We assume they're doing all the right things. Um, I can tell you that looking at providers and looking at physician burnout over the last few years, um, providers are completely overwhelmed. They are begging us for help in care coordination, in picking the right tests. Um, this lab point 1.0 relationship with just lab to providers won't won't stand uh, going forward in the next three to five years. We're going to have to do better. So what I propose is lab leadership, 2.0 leadership, means we're going to have a much bigger impact. The lab is going to be the hub of the information. The treating provider will always be the treating provider, but other people involved are going to be care coordination at a health plan maybe, pharmacists at a hospital or an outpatient, the quality care team at our hospitals or our other institutions. That's really where lab and lab 2.0 kind of leadership is going to be critical because that's going to require the lab leaders to start interacting much more closely with the other care leaders and to be an equal clinical colleague going forward. I'd like you to really think about that. We have to be equal clinical colleagues to our providers, managers, other people that are um, at the leadership level in healthcare, the laboratory really has to have a seat at the table. We cannot stay in the basement. Um, so with that, I hope those examples impress that you know, the lab can have a huge impact on patient outcome. We can, we can definitely contribute to the uh, triple aim and help our institutions and our enterprises and our clinical colleagues uh, achieve the, the uh, triple aim. And actually, we can do all three. We can have better quality. We can have better access. And, and we can lower the cost of care in America. And, and we don't have to compromise on one or two of those to achieve the other. All, all three of the triple aim actually are achievable, but it's going to require a big coordinated effort, and the lab should be an integral part of that. Um, a little plug, I guess, for any of you who might be interested in looking at a little bit more of this, the, uh, the Clinical Lab 2.0 uh, is really an initiative that came out of uh, what we call Project Santa Fe. Uh, a number of laboratories got together. And, and really is a coalition of laboratory leaders who believe that the lab can do more and should do more, and in our institutions it will do more. And um, so we're, we're really trying to push that movement. And this website I've listed here, there's demonstration projects of other of uh, those uh, institutions in addition to ours. Um, there's workshops. Uh, we put on to get people thinking in this direction from the laboratory um, and you know pushing to public uh, publish some of this is really going to be critical it's going to take way more uh, than talking about it um, at uh, national conferences we really have to publish and publish the outcomes and the financial impact and the quality impact and the access impact that laboratories can have on the healthcare enterprise. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to address them by email. 
Thank you, Dr. Crossy, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. As a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>